today um, we're here with our partners in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Annabella Francescan and her team, uh, Peter, the managing director, and Daniel, the operations uh, director. And Annabella, today you've brought us a very, very special guest. We're, we're, may I ask you please to introduce her? Hi, everybody. Right, my very, very special guest is uh, Dr. Cynthia Moss, very, very famous about elephants. Cynthia has been in Kenya and, in fact, the Amboseli National Park looking after elephants in a way and doing research and um, monitoring them for well over 40 years. And uh, she's been the greatest success and she's now our matriarch, our human elephant matriarch in the country. So we're very, very proud of her. Um, I hand over now to Jim to continue with Cynthia. Thank you very much, Annabella. And welcome, Cynthia, to uh, a Holden Safari's fireside chat. Very good of you and kind of you to make yourself available because I know you're not only a very busy person, but you live in a remote area. And I think the journey to Nairobi, you're actually in Nairobi, I gather, the journey to Nairobi starts with a long walk, doesn't it? Until you can find something on wheels. <laughs> Welcome. Is that right? <laughs> well, no, I actually flew up <laughs> in an airplane, ah. thank goodness. Otherwise, it's a long drive. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, very nice. So just to orientate our listeners, uh, you're in Amboseli. Most of your work now currently is in Amboseli, which is southeast of Nairobi. Uh, about a what uh, flight? How long is your flight, Cynthia, to get up to Nairobi? 35 minutes. 35 minutes. So uh, we have groups that um, visit Kenya and are expertly handled by Annabella and her team at Manyago Safaris. And one of the things we know, one of the groups is called Women with a Purpose. And the women with a purpose love elephants, especially baby <laughs> elephants. So yes. they're going to be intrigued and uh, very interested to, to hear uh, you talk about your work. But before we start that, can I just ask you, because you're an American, uh, to give us a little bit of your background. I believe you're, new, you're, you're a New Yorker, is that right? That's correct. <laughs> yes. So tell us no. a bit about where you come from. I gather it's a little town and I can't even pronounce it, let alone know where it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, well, I was born in Ossining, New York. It's a it's a Indian American Indian name, it means rock upon rock because it slopes up from the Hudson River, which is just north of New York City. But anyway, I um, I lived, uh, grew up in New York, um, and then started working in New York City, and then came on a safari and to Africa in 1967 and fell in love with Africa and elephants <laughs> and I was invited to come back and be a research assistant on a project in Tanzania and in, I came in January 1968 so I've been here for almost 53 years <laughs> and I, I worked on that project for about a year mm -hmm. and then eventually I started my own project in Amboseli in 1972 so that project has been going for 48 years. It's the longest running uh, study of elephants in the world. Uh, in fact, it's one of the longest studies of any mammal in the world. And um, we, uh, we know all the elephants in Amboseli. They all have names or numbers and we've been following their lives since all the ones that were alive then, 1972 and all the births and since then. And, um, I have a team. I have a wonderful team. All, we're all women, <laughs> which is, isn't surprising because women make much better observers. And, uh, and we, uh, we study their, their life, their, their uh, family life, their reproduction. We do study the males as well. We don't ignore them. And um, we've, we've been doing this, as I said, for many, many years. And we've written many books. We've done films. We've done many, many articles, many TV programs, and um, much of what we know about elephants comes from this study. You know, it's, it's a very, very thorough study of known individuals over time, and that's sort of gold in a research project. 
And um, yeah, so I'm there. I'm still there, although I'm getting old, but I'm still, still going every day and going out and seeing the elephants and still can drive a Land Rover, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, you certainly look all right, uh, Cynthia. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. And Cynthia, that's very interesting, your um, background, where you come from. And can I go back to when you first arrived in uh, Manuara? And yeah. to my mind, that's Ian Douglas Hamilton, who, of course, uh, we know with our sort of uh, English background. Now, yes. am, I, am I right in saying you would then, if you came as a research assistant with Ian Douglas Hamilton, you were actually at a groundbreaking moment because wasn't that the really the start and the public after the publication of his books and the research that you were all doing there wasn't that the start of the realization that elephants are not just these objects that sort of move about in the bush and are entertaining sometimes they're yeah. a very complex society modeled in many ways on our own and yes. worth our while to try to understand them and look after them wasn't that the, the start of it all? Well, yeah, I would say so, definitely. No one, uh, no one had studied elephants in that way before. The, the way people did studies back then was to shoot them, actually, and look at their reproductive organs. That was the way people studied things like elephants. And Ian was the first person to do individual recognition, so following known individuals. And he was the one who confirmed that elephants live in families and and each family is led by the oldest female the matriarch he definitely he confirmed all that and that their society was rather complex and um, that the bulls lived separately and um, only came really came in touch with the females for mating and uh, yes that was a pi definitely a pioneering study his study yeah well we're very fortunate obviously that um uh, you and Ian started this whole process and that we now have a much, much better appreciation uh, of elephants. And I want to, I want to uh, uh, have you just uh, talk about another um, rather shocking period because you went on from there, as you say, to Amboseli. And for, uh, there for a while you worked with Dr. David Weston uh, in Amboseli uh, at a period, and I'm not quite sure of my dates, I think it was in the 80s or something, because I can remember, I'm of an age as well, Cynthia, that I can remember these things. But yes, I can yeah. remember there was a dreadful period of terrible drought in Amboseli. And there were these harrowing pictures of starving elephants and what to do. And I can remember there was great tension between the scientists of let oh, yes. nature take its course or yes. let's intervene and do something. And in many ways, Cynthia, I'm reminded that here in the USA, the scientists are squabbling over the same issue over COVID. Do we just let all the weak ones die and get on with life or should we intervene? Would you talk to that period? Because I can remember there was great angst amongst the donors um, that how yeah. should people share such dreadful pictures? And you were there. Well, actually, that was in the 70s. And, and the, the serious drought then was in hmm. Savo National Park. And there was a huge fight between the warden, David Sheldrick, and a scientist named uh, Dick Laws. And uh, they were still of the, of the kind that in order to study the elephants, we have to shoot 300, you know, and, and look at and see, you know, how old they are, whether they've had calves, et cetera. And David was very much against this. And it caused a huge controversy. And he actually won in the end, David Sheldrick won, and the, and the scientists left without doing this culling that they wanted to do. And it's been a controversy, really not so much now, but for the next 20, 20 years or more, it was a kind of, you know, because uh, they'd been uh, killing elephants in Kruger National Park in South Africa every year to keep the population in a certain state certain numbers and it was so cruel and then they would they would kill the whole family and then they'd capture the babies and they'd sell them or put them in zoos or whatever and uh, it's it's uh it's been a, a controversy between southern africa and east africa we have very different different points of view about animal, about wildlife and how in southern africa they believe wildlife has to pay its way unless it pays its way then the 
then they're worthless. But that fortunately, Kenya has never had that point of view. And uh, wildlife is, is, is valuable in its own right. So that's one good thing about working in Kenya. So what do you do to try to make sure that there's enough uh, resources for the uh, elephants in Amboseli? As, as they well, I'm sorry, we hasn't had the same problem, uh, although we have had very serious droughts. There's nothing you can do when there's a serious drought. But uh, in order to keep the Amboseli elephants safe and healthy, we have to make sure we keep the land. And uh, the, the problem there, our main problem in terms of the future of the Amboseli elephants, is changes in land use because uh, Amboseli is actually a very small park by African standards. It's only 392 square kilometers, 150 square miles for our American friends. And um, that's tiny for an African park, but the ecosystem that which surrounds Amboseli and extends into Tanzania and parts uh, is about 8,000 square kilometers. And that, has remained open except one side to the east is, is pretty much closed down but the rest of it's still open it's still open across in Tanzania and that is the that that they cannot survive without that outside I mean in any given day you only get about 500 elephants in the park and they're now about 17 1800 elephants all the rest of them are outside that means there's 12 or 1300 elephants out on the land, on, on the, uh, the Maasai land. Now we're very lucky because our, because Amboseli, in fact this is why Amboseli is still such a wonderful place for wildlife is because it's surrounded by Maasai. The Maasai people don't hunt um, wildlife for food or for trophies so they, uh, it, it's able to, uh, wildlife and uh, people are able to coexist, although that's rapidly changing if as, as once people start farming or changing their land use patterns. So that's our, that's our problem for the future. Right. It, it's fascinating, uh, Cynthia. So when you say open, that's what you mean, that, that the elephants, that there's a corridor, that there's, not, there's not a fence or whatever blocking their path. That's yes. what you mean. So they can cross yes. over, because of course, just to orientate our listeners, uh, Amboseli is at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro, right on the border with, uh, between Kenya and Tanzania. Yes, no, yes, well, yes, we're, we're trying to maintain all those corridors. At the moment, uh, they can pretty much move out at, 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 in any spot except to the east, and the east is where we're fighting for a corridor right now. Right. Now, what happens though, so they're out of the park uh, where there are no rangers, uh, but as you point out, they're with Maasai who don't hunt them. Uh, but now what about the poachers who have other evil intentions of harvesting their ivory? How do you, how do you look after the herds that are outside the park? Okay, well, there's a very wonderful organization called the Big Life Foundation, which is headed up by, in, in Kenya by Richard Barnum, who you may have met, uh, yes. who, based in the Chulu Hills. And they have 350 scouts, Maasai scouts, that are, you know, have full salaries and equipment and vehicles, and they're patrolling out there every day. And uh, they are, it's such a successful program. There's, there's virtually been uh, no elephant poaching in, in several years. And the poaching for bush meat has gone down, gone right down, although it's still occurring, but it's, and then, Closer to the park, there's uh, one of the, the group branch that surrounds the park has have their own uh, group of scouts, um, and that's Ogulaluwe group branch. They they pay another 50 scouts or so. So when you put those together, you, like that's maybe almost 400 people. Every one of those Maasai has a telephone. I'm sure because everybody has a has a mobile phone these days. Every one of them has at least 10 relatives with phones. Now think about all those eyes and ears on the ground. That's a lot. That's a lot of people out there. Right. And um, so it's very hard for people to operate, to, for poachers to operate, yeah. so, which is great news. It's been, it's been good over the last 10 years or so that, that Big Life started in 2000, 
20,010. Right. Yeah. So that makes total sense. And of course, over here, as you, as you know, and in other parts of the world, policing uh, in cities, for example, uh, police have realized you can't, you can't cover every single area in the city. You've got to rely on the eyes and ears of the populace. Yes. But for that, of course, the populace has got to be on board yeah. uh, that they're there to keep uh, law and order. What yes. happens in your case, you just touched on it. Um, is there tension between the Maasai who, as you say now, are wanting to plant crops, plant the fields. Elephants love their um, mangoes, their squash, whatever it is. Yes. Um, how, talk to that for a little bit, the human-wildlife conflict. Yes, well, that occurs um, to the east of the park, to what used to be called Kamana Group Ranch. And uh, that's all been subdivided. It you know, was a group ranch, but it became individual plots. So it was subdivided about, well, probably about 15 years ago. And uh, it's been a bit of a disaster because uh, a lot of the Maasai sold their land to non-Maasai who then started uh, either, either built lodges or a lot of lodges out there, too many, or they are now farming. And then, they, and then of course the elephants have always been there and there they find some tomatoes on their normal <laughs> path and they're going to eat them, of course. And um, yeah. so there is conflict, but... Um, there are people working on it. There's, there's uh, a very good fence that they created, uh, several kilometers of fence that Big Life put up to, to try to stop the conflict. And it's helped, it's helped but there's still conflict. There's still yeah. conflict. No, indeed. But uh, yes, it's good though that um, th uh, something's being, uh, being done about it. People are trying to deal with it. Let's move yes. on to something else, Cynthia, we wanted to ask you. Uh, and I don't know how out of date we are. But I gather it was quite a significant occurrence when there was another set of twins born to uh, elephants in Amboseli. And when I say another set, I think that was at the beginning of this year, 2020 or something. And then before that, it was like sort of 2018. And then you have to go right back to sort of 1960 or something. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, the first set of twins, and twins are very rare. I mean, they have been recorded in some other populations. Usually one of them dies because the female, the mother doesn't really have enough milk for two, you know, for two calves. Um, but the first set of twins we ever recorded was in 1980. And those two, a boy and girl, survived to adulthood and beyond, way beyond. And, um, and were very healthy and, and uh, and in fact, one of them, sadly, the female died when she was about 37. She died in 2017. Uh, we think maybe uh, she died with a birth complication because uh, she wasn't that old. But the male is still still there, and he com comes into must, this period of act active uh, sexual activity, and he's, um, he's quite a formidable animal. So we had to wait 38 years for another a set of twins and we I always once we had the one set I thought we'd be seeing other sets and then we didn't we didn't 38 years later in 2018 uh, a female named Paru gave birth to twins again a male and female and sadly the female of that twin died when she was about six months old six months old and we're not sure why and the male is still okay and then uh, then we only had to wait another two years and then in February, Angelina had twins, a male and female. And then in July, I discovered a second set that had been, I estimated they'd been born in April, and that's two little males. And the, the, oh, those two sets of twins are doing well. Fabulous. But, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, a fa that's a fabulous story. Why yeah. is it that, is there any theory as to why it's taken so long? Uh, no, no, no idea. I think it's just a really rare occurrence, and it's it was odd that it happened. And they were in very good condition, so maybe that because they've been having uh, we've been having good rains, so there's a lot of vegetation, so it might have something to do with that. Odd things do happen in nature, don't they? And um, I don't know if you were actually involved in any of the research, but uh, we 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 were informed about this dreadful incident in Botswana where oh, elephants yeah. seem to have some sort of neurological um, reaction from, and who, who knows what, but I think it was traced to some sort of 
natural poison in the water or the plants or something? Is that right? Do you know anything about so, it? So they say, but I don't know. And I don't know whether to believe it or not. But yeah. I have no idea. You know, I have no first-hand experience at all. No. So I suppose yeah. it's, again, one of these things. We just have to be very careful uh, what we do with our trash and what we do with yes. uh, the planet around yes. us to make sure that we keep, Absolutely. It, keep Absolutely. it all healthy. We never know who's yeah. coming by to take a bite out of it. Uh, no. A, 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 way, a, wayward, a wayward elephant. Yes. Cynthia, let's move on. And we love uh, the idea, and Annabella and her team normally try to build in a visit to your uh, yes. trust in Amboseli for our clients. What is it that you would want them to register or learn? If you had to pick one thing um, and you say, gosh, you know, if you're going to remember one thing from your visit, this is what I'd really like you to to learn and appreciate and maybe spread the word? What would it be? I think, um, I think what I want them to understand is, is just how intelligent and complex elephants are and how worthy they are to be saved, you know, and that, that they're incredible animals. And that, uh, you know, I talk when I, when I do have visitors, I, I tell them all about the, the, uh, family structure and the, and the very complex multi-layered social system they have and uh, and how it all operates and people always seem to love to hear hear all about that and hear about the matriarchs and the big adult male boy you know the big males and so I think it, that's really it that uh, they're not just sort of eating machines out there you know there's such caring, caring and uh, empathetic and uh, emotional animals, very emotional. So, yeah. Well, that, 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 that's very nice. And I think, I think through your work and the publication of your books, there's greater awareness now uh, of yeah. not just elephants, but you know, in the animal kingdom, it's a very complex place. Even, even may I say, uh, the little lowly dung beetle. Going oh, about his, they're fantastic. Yeah. Going about his business. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so the other question I want to ask you then is, so uh, as you know, Dame Daphne Sheldrick, before she passed, uh, published her memoir, and mm -hmm. uh, there's stories in there of her and her matriarch, uh, Eleanor. And, yes. Um, uh, they of course had a great bond, and uh, Dame Daphne could go out and say hello to Eleanor. And of course, there's that story of the elephant she thought was Eleanor, and it wasn't. Yeah, Eleanor, I know, um, I know. That then seemed to be very embarrassed, uh, having knocked uh, Dame Daphne over. So the question for you, after all this time, Cynthia, um, yes. studying your elephants, and as you just uh, told us at the beginning, the longest period of time that any um, herd of elephants has been studied, what happens in your relationship with those elephants? Do they, oh, here comes Cynthia today. Morning, Cynthia. I mean, what happens? Or do you try to protect it? Do you try not to develop that? Well, we, we don't have a, any relationship that involves touch or anything, but they do know us. They know me and my, my two research assistants. You know, they have an incredible sense of smell. They have a better sense of smell than a dog. So if you can, you know, more receptors in their trunks than a dog. And um, so I'm sure as soon as we drive up, they immediately know who's in. And we, we have evidence that they know who's in the car because some, you know, they just completely go about their business. They don't pay any attention. Although some of them do kind of say hello sometimes, but, but, um, but generally they just ignore us when we drive up because they know a vehicle, they know our smell, they know our voices. Um, and when we have somebody different in the car or stranger in the car there you can see a reaction sometimes you know they'll oh you know they'll just sort of start smell the car you know lift their trunk so they know they're aware they're very aware of what's going on around them and they just may not uh, let you know that they're you know, they're aware but they are but some of the families there was I did a whole series of films on one of the families called the, the EB family led by the wonderful matriarch Echo and um, I, with my, the cameraman and I just spent hours and hours and years with them actually. And they, sometimes one of them, such of the two oldest females, they'll, they'll give a little rumble and an ear flap when, when I arrive, just sort of an acknowledgement. But, you know, we don't, other than that, we don't have a relationship. 
but uh, that always pleases me when they show any recognition. So, very nice, very nice. What um, we've heard uh, um, differing stories about the distances that uh, elephants can communicate over. And you mentioned, yes. you mentioned uh, Southern Africa taking this rather more brutal approach to uh, culling elephants. Yes. And uh, I think that's where this information was published, that one heard uh, 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 suffering that fate or experiencing yeah. that fate can transmit yeah. as far as five kilometers to another herd. Get the hell out of here. These guys yes. are coming with bad intentions. Is that right? Yes. Well, we know they can, he, they can uh, hear the calls of other elephants from at least two kilometers. We've done experiments and uh, from two or more kilometers away. And they can detect who the individual is from one kilometer away. They know which individual is calling, so, uh, which is pretty amazing. But also there's a woman named Caitlin O'Connell who did studies in Namibia. And she, she uh, showed that they, they, uh, they, can t they, they get vibrations from other elephants through the ground. And that's probably, probably that open land, you know, open desert lands probably it conveys it better. And that they can they can pick up sensations and communicate that way. Yeah, so it's rather like whales. I, I gather can communicate yeah. similarly through yeah. sounds that we can't they, hear. Uh, they're just yes, that's, that's, it's called infrasound when it's below the range of human hearing, and so we don't hear it, but they hear it. <laughs> right, right. So yeah. since here we're sort of coming to the end of our time, um, if I can ask you when. Um, in all this work that you've done, uh, what would you want to tell someone if you could uh, only tell them one thing that you found fascinating studying elephants that we wouldn't know? I mean, there's lots we wouldn't know, obviously, but uh, something that somebody would find extraordinary. You've already mentioned oh. some. <laughs> We're talking about the way they communicate and they can recognize who's yeah. talking from two kilometers away. That's quite extraordinary. But yes. what, of, of all their uh, unique behavior, what would you pick to say to someone, I bet you didn't know this, and I bet you probably don't believe it, about <laughs> elephants? Okay, this was a, a study colleagues did, and they, um, they, they do what, what are called playback experiments, where you, you have recorded something and you play it back to the, in, to the, in a very scientific way. You know? And uh, one of the things that, that was fascinating that they found is that elephants can tell who, what kind of person is speaking, <laughs> whether it's a what? man or woman, whether it's a Maasai or a Kamba, or somebody speak. Yes, they can tell the difference. That is incredible. I can't even tell the difference. <laughs> Goodness <laughs> me, that is incredible. That is yeah. incredible. Yeah, because you see, the Maasai are frightening. They, they, they're scared of the Maasai, which is actually good because it means they can all live together. But they're less afraid of, of, of other Kenyans. And so they, uh, when, when, yeah, that's amazing. Just at a normal talking range, they can tell the difference. That's extraordinary. <laughs> what about yes. the, um, you've reminded me, um, and I don't know whether this is true or not, uh, of trying to keep elephants out of shambas, uh, farmers' uh, gardens, uh, is they um, put, have beehives. And it's, oh, it's yes. amusing to think that the little lowly bee can chase yeah. away this <laughs> largest land mammal because he's terrified of the bee. Is that true or well, not? They, oh, absolutely. There's a whole project a woman named Lucy King has been uh, doing. It's very successful where they put beehive fences up and it's, it's around farms and the elephants just don't want to get in you know, don't want to mess with them, so to speak. Yeah, no, it, we're, it's, a, it's a very successful project. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And it sounds then as though that could be a good uh, solution for keeping the elephants yes. out, of their, out of their garden. And well, on that... Another, oh, sorry. It gives another source of revenue for the person. The yes, farmers. of course, indeed, uh, yeah. indeed, yes. Yeah. And as you may well know, Cynthia, over here in the States, I believe it's still a big mystery that uh, bee populations are declining uh, oh, rapidly. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I don't yeah. think anybody really, really knows why. Although, here you are, Cynthia, I bet you didn't think that you would learn something 
on this uh, interview from me. You may know this already. Did you know that one of the reasons they found for the declining bee population is what they've called a murderous hornet? Have you heard of this? Oh, I have heard about those, yes. Yeah, it's uh, horrible. It's living, the hornet the gets into hornet, the beehive yes. and kills them all. I what know. Dreadful Terr fellow. Ter yeah. ter ter terrifying, yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, it amused me. Um, there you are dealing with the largest land uh, 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 mammal, and there they are dealing with this tiny little hornet on whom they strap a little radar to track him. Seems extraordinary. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> well, Cynthia, this has been a fascinating talk. Um, thank you very much. I'm very aware of the time. And um, we're going to uh, relay this and play it to our travel agents, who I know are going to be fascinated to... Uh, hear the uh, stories and the anecdotes you've mentioned and of course are going to be very interested to send their clients to visit your trust in uh, in Amboseli. So thank you very much for giving us your time. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and I guess it's good night, right? Nairobi, what's the time there? It's good night and uh, good morning. Almost morning. seven. Almost seven. seven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good night. Thank you again. Thank you.